Welcome to our um, this week's version of our webinar Wednesday. Um, again, we've um, been doing these weekly for the last several weeks, and we'll continue with this for um, the foreseeable future until you know some of our situations uh, here in the U.S. and around the world kind of calm down, allow us to do a little bit more personal site visits, like um, what we prefer to do. But I, I think these have been going um, very well um, up to this point. A um, couple of things I want to uh, just discuss about our um, the webinar today in the Zoom conference. Um, we haven't been having any problems with the Zoom conference bandwidth, so to speak, lately. They keep telling us that it's, it's possible, but um, we've, we've been fortunate, so hopefully that'll continue. Um, on the bottom of your um, screen, there will be a Q&A box as for the question and answers, and we, we prefer you, to, if you have any questions, to use that Q&A box to post your questions. Um, I can see them in advance. Sometimes I can answer them uh, very short, easy ones in text to the group or answer them live. And then we also have a, a, a tally of that after the fact. So I um, prefer all the questions to go into that Q&A box um, and that way we can um, properly respond to them. Um, also, um, when the presentation is done, all those registered people registered for this uh, webinar We'll get an email in the next day or so um, that will have a link to this presentation so that you can access it after the fact later to um, look at it slower and, and get the information at your pace and also as a reference point. Um, next week, we will have uh, just a little promotional thing. Next week, we'll have a webinar by Philip Perry again, and he will be talking about ventilation in the hatchery. So put that on your calendars. Hopefully, we'll see you there for um, that and talking about the importance of proper ventilation to really keep our um, machines operating properly because they really do need the proper environment for them to work like they like they should. So this week's um, webinar will be presented once again by Henry Cole. Um, he's got over 30 years um, experience in incubation and hatcheries themselves and then some other things outside of the hatchery, but um, a lot of good information. Um, some of his background experience has allowed him to work um, with um, in a type of industry where they did a lot of egg storage. And so the topic today is going to be spideys and long-term egg storage, as well as just regular egg storage. He's got a great presentation put together here. I think everybody will get a lot of good information out of it. And so for, with that, um, we will let Henry Cole go ahead and start with the presentation. And again, post questions as you have them. We don't get to them today. We'll get to them later, or you can even ask questions later uh, by email. So Henry, go ahead if you would. Thank you, Keith, and, and welcome, everyone. So, <clears throat> as Keith mentioned, my presentation, okay, there we go. Well, my presentation's on spideys and egg storage, and what we want to do is, is give you some thoughts and ideas on how to manage your eggs for improved hatchability. Um, my contact information is below and it'll also be on the last side, slide of this presentation. So if you have any questions that you want to direct to me, uh, you can do so. You can, answer, you can ask questions at the end of this presentation, uh, whatever works for you. You can also <clears throat> get in contact with um, webinars at jamesway.com and ask questions there as well and uh, someone will um, answer your questions. So during during these times I uh, just want to just make you all aware that you know Jamesway is here to help everyone. We do have our platinum response team available um, from anywhere in the world any time of the day or night you can contact us and somebody will return a phone call, return your phone call and try to help answer your, your questions. So <clears throat> let's get started. With these uncertain times that we're in with COVID-19, some of you are having issues selling chicks for a variety of reasons. Others of you can't hatch chicks fast enough to keep up with your demand. But both scenarios can have a negative impact on your hatchability. So we thought it would be important to review some basic egg storage practices and then get into a discussion on spideys. 
So <clears throat> some of you are thinking, can I use this information today? And my answer is yes. If you're hatching chickens, this is appropriate. Whether you're hatching turkeys, ducks, or any other species that you might be incubating and hatching, this information is appropriate. So for hatching egg storage, typical short-term storage, whether you're in single stage or multi-stage, optimum temperatures on the dry bulb in your egg storage room is somewhere around 65 to 68 Fahrenheit or 18 to 20 degrees Celsius. And that's pretty typical for the industry. Folks try to keep relative humidity somewhere around 75 to 80 percent humidity. We need to avoid direct blasts of cold air onto the exposed eggs. And the velocity of this recirculating air should also be kept to a minimum. And as you can see, the diagram <clears throat> up in the top right hand corner, a lot of times when I go into a hatchery and, and I'm going in through the egg storage room, the circulating fans or ceiling fans that they have uh, are actually blowing down on top of the eggs, which is not really what we want. We want those to be reversed and actually pulling air up toward the ceiling. This way we're not, you know, blasting cold air directly on to those eggs. And then if we're keeping eggs longer than seven days, <clears throat> we want to lower our temperatures. And typically most hatcheries will be somewhere around 58 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 14 to 16 Celsius. So what is the optimum storage time for eggs? And most folks in a hatchery understand that, <clears throat> you know, setting eggs right as, you know, the day that they're laid is, is not a good thing. So, Optimal storage time is somewhere around two, three, four days, somewhere in that area. And the reason behind this is it allows CO2 to be released from the albumin of the egg, which, is, which increases the pH of the albumin from around 7.6 to around nine. And, and this, is gonna be, this is gonna be important, and, and I'll explain why. The, this increase in pH is important and necessary because embryo development is governed by the enzyme, enzymes that are dependent on this pH change. So we need that rise in pH to activate enzymes to begin um, embryonic development. <clears throat> And then equally important is that pH change is vital to the protection of the embryo from bacterial contamination. And again, as the pH increases, we're getting more alkaline and that helps fight off any bacterial contamination that might enter the egg. The yolk pH stays relatively the same. It's gonna be somewhere around, uh, it's gonna start from around six and go up to around 6.5. And also this gradient in pH from albumin to yolk is also thought to optimize embryonic development. <clears throat> and as you can see in this chart here, the blue, the blue line indicates the rise in pH as egg age or storage age increases on the horizontal axis. And as the pH of the albumin increases, we're also seeing albumin height or thickness decrease. So let's take a little bit closer look of what's going on inside that egg during egg storage. As I mentioned, pH increases from 7.6 to around nine. The albumin height or thickness starts getting less or it reduces. The pH of the yolk increases from around six to 6.5. We're also seeing a 
uh, lowering in the strength of the yolk membrane, air cell will start to increase some, and then the embryo, embryo will remain in a stable stage of development if stored below 24 C. This is, this is thought by many folks, <clears throat> and a lot of folks will use the terminology of physiological zero. Well, as we go through this presentation, keep this in mind, and then at the end of the presentation, just kind of think back to this question, if the embryo remains in a stable state of development. I'm not gonna give you that answer, but you guys can, uh, you guys can make your own decision. <clears throat> so traditional methods to limit the effects of long-term storage, um, are there are several of those, and they do not prevent a reduction in hatchability, but they only help slow down the deterioration rate. So one of those things is reducing the egg storage room temperature, as I mentioned earlier. A lot of folks will turn eggs during storage. Not too many people do this, storing eggs pointed end up. This is extremely labor intensive. <clears throat> and then you've got some folks that will store eggs in boxes or on skids that are shrink wrapped. And that is, that is solely to help reduce moisture loss. So let's look at each of these in a little more depth. So traditional storage temperatures, um, this, this chart here um, will go through what typical storage temperatures sh should be as you're holding eggs out um, in storage. So if you're holding eggs one to three days, typical temperatures should be somewhere around 64 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 18 to 21 Celsius, with a relative humidity of 70 to 75. If you're holding eggs, you know, four to seven days, um, temperature should be in your egg storage room, 59 to 64 Fahrenheit, 15 to 18 Celsius, and again, 70 to 75 on relative humidity. And if we're going out to 12 days, we should be around 54 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit, 12 to 15 Celsius, and 75 to 80 on humidity. And then if you're going beyond 12 days, should be down somewhere around 54 degrees Fahrenheit or 12 C and 75 to 80% relative humidity. Now, I, I do wanna speak a little bit about the relative humidity. <clears throat> and from, a, from an embryo standpoint, from a physiological standpoint for that embryo, relative humidity in your egg storage room has no bearing, no impact on the survivability of that embryo. The reason you're keeping the humidity high, a little bit higher in your um, egg storage room is solely to help reduce moisture loss. So I don't get too hung up on this. Um, the, the big things to look for is, you know, however we're humidifying the air, we want to make sure that it's fine enough and we're not getting eggs wet. So if you're wetting eggs, then, then you're going to have an issue. And you know we don't we don't want that. So if you can't attain you know eighty per seventy five to eighty without wetting eggs, then I certainly wouldn't get up that high. Also, <clears throat> if you're like a lot of hatcheries, and the majority of your eggs you're you're uh, setting within four to seven days, but you do have some that you're holding out to ten or twelve days what you want to do is you want to set your um, egg storage temperature to the eggs that are being held the longest. Now, if you're lucky enough to have an egg storage, uh, a couple egg storage rooms, then you can, you can separate the, those eggs and run one room cooler than the next. But if you don't have that ability, you want to um, adjust your temperature so that your, your, you know, taking care of the eggs that are being held the longest. It doesn't matter if eggs are in there for one to three days and the temperature is down to 58, 59 
uh, degrees or you know, 12 to 15 C, it's not gonna hurt anything. <clears throat> so what are the lower temperatures doing? The lower temperatures are helping slow down the deterioration rate of the embryonic cells. It also slows down the physical deterioration of the albumin and yolk membranes. As I mentioned earlier on what's happening in the egg, we're seeing some deterioration of the albumin and the, you know, the membranes are getting thinner. This helps slow down that, de that deterioration rate. It doesn't correct it, but it helps slow it down. So what about turning during long-term egg storage? Turning allows the developing embryo to be in contact with fresh albumin, which is thought to be vital to optimal embryonic development. It can be very useful, especially for older flocks and when you're storing over 14 days of age. What about storing eggs small end up or upside down for us hatchery folk? <clears throat> the yolk remains in contact with the albumin which keeps the embryo from adhering to the shell membrane. However, this is extremely labor intensive. You're basically having to tray eggs twice. Once you're having to tray them upside down and then you have to retray them the right way with the air cell up. So needless to say, I don't see too many people doing this. And I haven't seen too many people do this, nor have I done this. And, but however, it can be beneficial if you're storing eggs over 14 days. <clears throat> I do need to mention a general rule of thumb here when setting eggs, especially when they're stored, when you're setting eggs that have been stored five days and beyond. Typically, you need to add one hour of incubation time for each additional day of storage past five days. I see some hatcheries that do this. I see others that don't. This is a good general rule of thumb. You might need to tweak things uh, based on your hatchery, but again, please keep this in mind, especially when you're dealing with, um, you know, extreme egg storage uh, ages. Another thing that's, that's critical and, and often overlooked is our egg handling practices from point of lay to set. And more specifically, this egg temperature flow chart. <clears throat> now you can see this chart, and I don't, I, again, I don't get too hung up on the exact temperatures here, um, but more, more important is the flow and the steps, and each step we need to uh, decrease our temperature so that we have this perfect V shape and V is for victory. If we have anything other than that, we start getting into some W's. The W stands for wrong. So let me go through this uh, quickly here for you. So when the egg is laid, uh, the hen's body is somewhere around, you know, 104 to 106 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 to 41 Celsius. Once the egg is laid, it is now going to be uh, deposited in a nest. So it will start dropping in temperature down to the temperature of that hen house. Then once the egg leaves the hen house on the egg conveyor, or if someone's manually picking the eggs up and they go into the farm egg storeroom or the, the egg packing room, that's our next step and the eggs need to be cooler than what they were in the hen house. And then if you have an egg cooler, that needs to be cooler than your egg packing room. Our egg transport needs to be cooler than what the eggs were stored at the farm. And then finally, last but not least, our hatchery egg room needs to be cooler then needs to be the coolest point in this process. A lot of times I'll go to hatcheries <clears throat> and the hatchery has their set point at somewhere between 65 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And I've, I've personally witnessed where the farm 
the farm cooler was somewhere around 60 to 58 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's gonna create some issues. So again, you know, just reviewing your process and making sure that we're following this V is, is critical to proper um, embryo, uh, not development, but um, if we start fluctuating in temperature much, it'll weaken that embryo and you're gonna have higher early mortality from the embryonic stage. Egg sweating, we all know egg sweating is not a good thing. And we've probably all seen this. <clears throat> and the reason this happens is the humidity around the egg, the cold egg, will cause condensation on these eggs. And that's never a good thing. It certainly allows bacterial contamination to more easily penetrate the egg through the pores. You'll also have a chilling effect on embryos and you'll see higher embryo mortality. So it's important to train your staff, train um, your egg pickup delivery guy to, to look out for this. We want to minimize, we want to eliminate any egg sweating. So we've seen this before. <clears throat> I'm gonna go through this again. Um, we've got the changes that are occurring within the egg. Again, the albumin, uh, the CO2 is being released from the albumin of the, from the albumin. So the pH increases, our albumin height decreases as storage age increases for those eggs. So let me throw hatchability on this graph. And you can see what happens with, with hatchability. And if you've been in a hatchery, you already know this, but within, um, you know, hatching eggs or setting eggs directly as they're laid is, is never really a good thing unless you have to. And I can, you know, there are times where you have to do that. But if you can keep the eggs for a few days before you set them, ideally that's optimal. You'll see an increase in hatchability. And then as storage increases, hatchability will decrease. <clears throat> so, why, so why are we seeing that decrease in hatchability? So following the advice of Mother Nature, we've got this lovely hen here, and she's laid four eggs, and she's about to lay a fifth egg. So when she gets on this nest and settles in to lay that fifth egg, she is performing spideys on these four that were already previously laid. So for some of you, what is SPIDES? What does it stand for? Well, SPIDES stands for short periods of incubation during egg storage. And this is what the mother hen does when she's laying her clutch of eggs. Every time she's laying an egg, she is doing a short period of incubation on the eggs that were laid previous. So, why spideys? Why is it important? Well, first, hatchability decreases as egg, in, egg, as egg age increases. We've talked about that and you all know that. Studies show that you can gain back 60% or more of what would have been lost if spideys was not performed. Now, let me, let me stop and repeat that. Studies show that you can gain back 60% or more of what would have been lost if spideys was not performed. The longer eggs are stored, the potential gain increases. <clears throat> so in this chart here, we'll go through this. We've got, we've got our different colored um, bar graph. The green indicates eggs that, were, that are fresh eggs with a hatchability of 89.5%. <clears throat> this yellow bar, solid yellow bar, the eggs were stored seven days, spideys was not performed, and we had an 86.7% hatch. Not too bad. And then 
On the striped yellow, we had eggs that were stored seven days, but were, but Spidey's was performed on it. And we had a hatchability of 89.2. So we gained two and a half percent hatchability or two and a half percent more chicks, poults, ducklings. What about eggs that are stored for 14 days? <clears throat> the, the, the solid orange bar, uh, we had a hatchability. Uh, they were stored 14 days, no spides. We had 83 and a half percent. The striped orange, eggs were stored 14 days with spides or spideys, and we had a hatchability of 87%. So we saw an increase of three and a half percent. So let's go out to 21 days, three week old eggs. Here's, here's three week old eggs, not spied. We had 62.6%, and here we had 21 day old eggs that we performed spides and we had a 76.9% hatch. So we gained 14.3%. That's a lot of chicks, poults or ducks right there that you would have lost had you not performed spides. <clears throat> so let's look at some studies here. Um, this, is a, this is one on decreasing hatchability as we know, with long-term egg storage. Vertical access is, that, is the hatch percent of all eggs set. The horizontal access is increasing egg age or days of storage. As I mentioned earlier, you're gonna see an increase in hatchability after the first few days. And again, that goes back to the reasons why you know, the release of CO2 from the albumin. But then once we get past that, we see a fairly rapid decline in hatchability. Here's another study, <clears throat> shows very similar results. Slight increase after the first few days of storage, and then a rapid decline in hatchability. Another study with layers, um, and, and you can see this is a, the regression line here in yellow is, is pretty indicative of a, a linear decline as egg age increases. Now you're gonna take a look, you're gonna see here these hatchability rates, and remember this was with layers and they only, they only account for the females, the males are not accounted for. So that's why these lower numbers here, just for your reference. <clears throat> so let's look at this a little bit differently. In this graph, we have in the vertical axis, the hatchability that is lost. So hatchability lost increases as storage length increases. And you can see this is a pretty linear increase. So for example, if you're taking a look at this, at say around 15 days of egg storage, you're losing around in this particular study, you know, 9.2% hatchability. So <clears throat> I'm gonna use the same graph. I'm gonna lay uh, a spides treatment because this, this red line, these eggs were not spied. So let's see what happens when we add spides to the mix and see what, what hatchability we, we lose. <clears throat> the blue line is now our, our spides line. And then I also have a couple of regression lines that I've added and I'll get to that in a moment. So again, this same red line from the slide previous shows that as egg age increases, hatch loss also increases. And you're gonna see the same with spides, egg age increases, hatch loss increases. But what I hope you do see is that the losses are much less. And then if you take a look at my gray regression lines, you can see that the further out you go, or the longer you're holding eggs in storage, 
look at the potential gain here in hatchability. That's, I mean, all this is chicks, but the longer you're having to hold eggs for whatever reason, there's a lot more potential to gain a lot of these chicks back that you would have lost if you did not perform spides. <clears throat> so in this study, we're looking at things again a, a little bit differently. Um, and this is now um, looking at on the vertical axis, we're looking at hatch improvement. The horizontal axis, we're still going out in egg age. Egg age is increasing as we're going out. And now look at our hatch improvement. So by using spides. So again, like I mentioned on the previous slide, the further you, or the longer you have to keep eggs, the, the bigger the improvement you're gonna see in hatchability. And in this particular case, little over 14, you know, percent when you're out, you know, around three weeks, three weeks of age. <clears throat> this is another study that's showing basically the same thing. Again, this is hatch improvement um, on the vertical axis, and we've got storage time increasing on the horizontal axis. And as storage time increases, your gain in hatchability through spides also increases. So when we're out around 22, 23 days, if you come across, we've gained about 55, 60% improvement on this particular study. So, you know, depending on how spides is perf um, actually um, performed in your hatchery, um, you know, you can gain anywhere from the previous slide showed 14% up to, you know, 60% or more. So why are we seeing these improvements with spides? What's happening here? <clears throat> well, there is evidence that spides reduces or rescues cells from dying while being held in storage. So we've seen this chart before. <clears throat> and again, um, we've got um, a, a, a chart here where we have on the horizontal axis increasing storage days, and then we've got our increase in, or our cell counts on this blue line. <clears throat> and as storage days increase, our cell counts or the embryo cell counts decrease. So ideally what we wanna do is we wanna try to keep these cell counts on the embryo somewhere up here. And we can do that by administering spides in proper incremental times. And we'll get to that in more detail. We'll go through this slide again, or go through this graph again in, in another slide. But again, that's the ultimate goal is try to keep these cells, um, you know, at an optimal level for good embryonic development. So before we go any further, We've got, I've got a few slides here and we need to do a little reproductive physiology. <clears throat> and some of you are probably going, oh gosh, no. And I mean, this will be high level folks, a high level. This is not going to be, you know, too in depth here. This is the reproductive tract of a hen. <clears throat> and here's, here's the, um, the ovaries. And when the hen ovulates, one of these follicles will, will release. We'll go into the infundibulum here, and this is where fertilization will occur. The, this, the, the, the ovum will stay in the infundibulum for somewhere in the range of 15 to 30 minutes or so, and then it migrates down into the magnum. <clears throat> it'll then stay, travel through the magnum, and it'll take somewhere around two to three hours or so to travel through this. And while it's traveling through here, albumin is being added around the, around the yolk and the embryo. It then goes into the isthmus. Again, it'll stay in the isthmus, you know, two to three hours. 
And this is where we're going to start seeing our, our first cell divisions. And we'll go from a, a one-celled zygote where half the material comes from the female and the other half from the male. And it'll start dividing or cleaving um, up to, you know, the morula phase, which is like a 16-cell um, uh, embryo. It'll then, this embryo will then go into the uterus where it will spend most of its time in the hen, uh, somewhere 18 to 26 hours or so uh, will be spent in the uterus. And then cell divisions or cleavages are continuing. We're going into the first blastula, second blastula phase. The shell is being laid around the egg and the or the yolk and the albumen and the embryo <clears throat> the egg then passes through the vagina where we've got the cuticle being deposited and then the egg will be laid the embryo will be somewhere in this pre gastula phase and have around 30 to 50,000 cells so Let's kind of look at this in a little more, a little, a little more carefully. Up here, we've got our zygote, which I mentioned. Half the genetic material came from the female, the other half from the male. So it's a one-celled uh, embryo at this point. We start cleaving and we go to two cells. The two cells become four, the four become eight, the eight becomes 16. 16 become 32, so on and so forth. And as you can see here, we've got our zygote, we've got our cells cleaving, we get into the blastula phase, and this happened in, this, this is now, the embryo is now in the blastula phase in the uterus. So it goes through a first blastula, second blastula. When you dissect this blastula, it's basically, a, like a hollow, a hollow egg <clears throat> inside. And what's happening is as, as that embryo is developing and going into this uh, pregastula phase, the, the bottom or the egg starts to come in upon itself. So it's, it's kind of working itself inward. It's folding itself inward. So this is what we see with a fresh fertile egg. <clears throat> so why is this important? Why did I go through that? Well, there, there's been a few studies that we're gonna go through here that will show what's happening to the embryonic cells as it relates to egg storage. In this particular study, we've got on the vertical axis, we got viable, um, embryonic cells, and then again, horizontal axis, increasing storage time. So at four days of storage, or four days after lay, we have 81.17% of the embryo cells that are still viable. So by four days of storage, we've already lost close to 19% of those embryo cells. Look what happens at 14 days. When those eggs are, when that embryo is at 14 days, that embryo has 68.18% of the cells left or roughly 32% of that embryo cells have died <clears throat> or close to a third have died by 14 days. This next slide is gonna be a little more dramatic. <clears throat> We've got on the vertical axis, we've got the number of live cells. Horizontal axis, again, increasing storage time. In this particular study, <clears throat> um, they looked at eggs between three and four days of storage, and we had around 33,000 cells left on that embryo. Now remember, on the previous slide, we've already lost close to 19% by this time. Now 10 to 12 days, we're down to about 15,000 cells. So 
this embryo has lost over half of its cells by 10 to 12 days. What happens at 17 days? Unbelievable. We've got about 11,000 cells left for this embryo. It's lost two thirds of its cells compared to this one. Two thirds of its cells have died. And then we wonder why hatchability goes down, chick quality goes down, early embryonic mortality goes up. It's because of this. <clears throat> so let's, let's look at the same thing, but something that you, can got, you guys can visualize a little bit better. In this particular study, we've got uh, four eggs that were held for 14 days, were placed in an incubator at 100 degrees Fahrenheit for three and a half hours. Eggs were removed, and then the, the embryonic disc was measured. The NP stands for no pre-incubation or no spides. The one PI stands for one pre-incubation or, or one spides. And the two PI is two pre-incubation or two spides. <clears throat> and you can kind of see just on here the differences, but we're, we're gonna actually, in this study, they actually measured that embryo. So on 14 day old eggs, incubated at 100 degrees Fahrenheit for three and a half hours, no spides or spides, that embryo disc was 3.76 millimeters in diameter. With one spides, that embryo disc was 4.39 millimeters. And with two spides, we had 5.65 millimeters. So obviously this embryo and this embryo, the reason they're bigger is because there's, there's more cells there. And the reason there's more cells there is because we revitalized cells that would have died if we didn't do and didn't perform spides. <clears throat> so hopefully these next three slides will hit it home for you if it, if it hasn't already, because it certainly did for me. This is the exact same study. Eggs restored for 14 days. We've got no spides. We've got one spides and two spides. This time the eggs were then incubated for 52 hours. <clears throat> so on this particular slide, we've got eggs that were stored for 14 days, no spides, and you can see the embryonic development, you know, starting to see um, the blood ring. Now look at this one compared to this one. <clears throat> Here, 14 days old eggs with one spides treatment, 52 hours of incubation. Look at the amount of embryonic growth, vascularization going on. And if this, this next slide doesn't hit it home for you, I don't know what will. Look at this embryo with two spidey treatments. Unbelievable. So we saw this slide before, or this graph before. <clears throat> And the frequency of spides or spides will impact your results. So again, we've got cell counts on the vertical axis, increasing storage on the horizontal axis. This blue line here is number of cells. And we know that as we hold eggs, we've got a destruction or, um, of our embryo cells. This vertical line here is our point of lay. And then each vertical line thereafter, dotted line, is in six day increments. <clears throat> so in this particular study, they performed spides at six days. And we're going to look at the solid red line at this point. So they performed spides at six days. Then again at 12 days, and then again at 18 days. So every six days thereafter to keep the viable cells, the viable embryo cells fairly constant. Now, what if you <clears throat> did it less frequent? So let's look at the, 
the dotted red line. So we performed the first spide treatment, spidey's treatment at, at six days of storage. We had our increase. And then as that embryo it continues to go through storage, cells are continuing to die. And then they again hit it again around nine, 10 days again, a nine, 10 days of storage time, they perform another spidey treatment. We see a, a, a boost and it'll then continue to drop off. <clears throat> Will you see improved hatchability here? Yeah, you're gonna see some improved hatchability without a doubt. But again, if you're keeping eggs, you know, out here, you know, say three weeks or so, um, there is a potential loss that you could be getting if you would have performed, you know, a, a third treatment, you know, five to six days apart. There's a loss here. Well, some of you are thinking, okay, well, <clears throat> you know, this is great. What if I do it more often? What's going to happen? Well, um, most, most times people will think more of a good thing is a better thing. No, it usually isn't. Um, so let's take a look at that. So we're going to look at this dotted uh, blue line now. And they're going to do a spy treatment every three days. And we're going to get close to this point of no return. What does that mean? That means we have developed that embryo past the point of no return, meaning that once we go past this and we don't continue with the incubation process, we're going to have high early embryonic mortality. So again, too much of a good thing is not a good thing. So again, through, from this study, it shows that um, performing the spy treatments, or the first one around five to six days of storage, and then every five to six days thereafter um, is, is optimal. When I've done this, this is pretty much the same scenario that I've, I've performed them at, and it works just perfectly. <clears throat> So what are our advantages and disadvantages of SPIDES? Well, one of the advantages is it allows for long-term storage with acceptable hatchability. And we've seen that through this presentation so far. It allows for long-term storage and acceptable chick quality. So let, let's talk about that for just a moment. <clears throat> this chick here on the left is a chick from a four day old egg or an egg that was stored for four days. This little guy here is a chick from an egg that was in storage for 14 days. And look at the difference. You're gonna see lower body weights. You're gonna see chicks that are less, um, less, vit less vigorous. You can see this chick can't even open its eyes um, because it's just, it's just not feeling well. They'll be paler in appearance. You're going to have issues with legs. You're going to have hawk issues, uh, red hawks. You're going to have uh, red on the beak, and you're going to have navel problems. And if, if you guys have been in a hatchery for any period of time and you've hatched eggs that were, you know, 14 days plus, you've probably seen a bunch of these chicks. By performing spides, you're going to see more of these, guaranteed. <clears throat> It'll narrow your hatch window. You can now incubate within the same incubator 14-day-old eggs and 4-day-old eggs and have a much tighter hatch window. You're going to have lower embryonic mortality. It'll allow for larger orders with a smaller amount of breeders on the ground. So what are some disadvantages? And yes, there are a few disadvantages. <clears throat> the first one and biggest one <clears throat> is it, in, it there's an increase in labor and man hours to handle these eggs. Moving these eggs around, putting them in an incubator, taking them back out, putting them in egg storage. It also complicates your, your egg flow in your egg storage room. 
and we'll get into that in just a moment. But there are some there are some things that you need to you know think about if you're wanting to perform spideys. So let's do a little quick summary here, because um, I know I've thrown a lot of information at you folks. Um, as storage days increase, so does the destruction of embryonic cells. Hatchability decreases as storage time increases. And this is due to the destruction of those embryonic cells. Storage time over 17 days, you can see up to a 70% increase or 70% of the embryo cells will have died once you get past 17 days of storage, which is huge. Especially if you're that embryo. <clears throat> Applying spideys for eggs held during long-term long storage helps overcome this cell mortality. So let's get into some practical advice, some recommendations on how to perform spideys. So first, hatching eggs over 10 days, if you're keeping eggs over 10 days, oh, over 10 days after lay, I recommend one spidey treatment. And that treatment needs to be given between five and six days of egg storage. Now, some of you may say, hey, I don't get my eggs until they're six or seven days um, old because they're out on the farm prior to that. Well, as soon as you can then is when you want to perform that spidey treatment. The second one is hatching eggs over 15 days. If you're keeping eggs over 15 days, I recommend two spidey treatments. The first one, again, between five and six days of egg storage, and the second one given between 10 and 12. Again, five to six days after the first. And every, every treatment should be five to six days after the first. <clears throat> so if you don't get your eggs until they're six days into the hatchery and you spidey them on seven, you want to do every five to six days after that. And then if you're keeping eggs over 21 days, I recommend at least two, if not three, spidey treatments. The first one, between five and six days of storage. The second, between 10 and 12. And the third, if you're going to do a third, is between 15 and 18 days. <clears throat> so let's go through the procedure. Eggs need to be placed on your setter egg trays. And then these trays placed on your setter racks or on farm racks is acceptable. <clears throat> Eggs on plastic fiber, plastic or fiber flats on skids or in boxes is not advisable. And the reason being is you're not gonna get the, the, the heating or be able to cool that egg pack effectively. So you can't use eggs that are stored in this fashion. <clears throat> eggs can be treated in single stage, which would be ideal, or in multi-stage incubators. However, if you're using multi-stage, you need to be careful that you do not overload the heating capacity or disrupt the airflow within that machine. And then eggs must be given enough time to reach a minimum of 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 C. If you're in North America and you have our pilot eggs, you can use our pilot eggs or you can use data loggers to measure um, the shell temperature or some people will, will tape an electrotherm onto some, onto some eggs to measure shell temperature. However you do that, um, you just want to be able to get all the eggs at least to 90, they have to get at least to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is just a picture of our pilot eggs. Again, if you have them, you know what they look like. Nice thing about the pilot eggs is we've got our pilot sitting here in the middle and it's actually monitoring the shell temperature of four adjacent eggs. And you can see those temperatures real time on, on your Hatchcom computer, which is, which is pretty nice. And this is just the pilot egg um, in amongst an egg pack. <clears throat> so 
So as I mentioned before, we want to give our first treatment five to six days of egg storage, ideally. If you can't, then as soon as you can um, perform spideys, you want to do that. Additional treatment should be every five to six days thereafter. Again, if we're not treating eggs until eight days, um, then you do again five to six days thereafter. Once eggshell has reached the 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 C, and that means all the eggs are to that point, then you can begin to cool the eggs as quickly and as evenly as possible, um, back down to the egg storage temperature. With single stage, um, ideally you can cool them in the machine. And with multi-stage, you're gonna have to remove the eggs and then place the eggs in the egg storeroom. However, you need to keep in mind, you do not want to place these eggs next to eggs that are not spidey. These eggs are warm. They're 90 plus degrees. You need to make sure that they're kept separate from your other eggs. The other thing that's extremely important is that you space out your racks evenly so that the eggs can cool evenly and quickly. If you pile them and lump them all together in a corner, they're not going to cool very quickly nor evenly. <clears throat> so some general guidelines. And I've got a few um, that I'm going to mention, but I do want to mention that every hatchery is going to vary slightly. And these are just recommendations that, you know, are given to as a guide. So please check your eggshell temperatures and kind of develop your own Spidey's program. If you need help, please feel free to contact me. I'm available or contact somebody from James Way and we can certainly aid and assist you in developing a Spidey's program for you. So typically in our James Way single stage machines, you would run the temperature or have the set point at 99 degrees Fahrenheit or 37.2 or degrees Celsius. Once the machine is up to that temperature, you're going to hold them for two to four hours so that all the eggs get up to at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you can begin the cooling process as quickly and as evenly as possible. If you're going to use our multi-stage machines or anybody else's multi-stage machines or anybody else's single stage machines, um, again, um, if you're using a single stage, you can probably do the 99 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but again, monitor your eggshell temperatures to determine for how long you're going to need to keep it at that point. For multi-stage machines, you're going to have to monitor shell temperatures because you can get, um, you can get up to that temperature fairly quickly um, within four or five, six hours. Um, and then you're going to have to take them out. So, Again, you're going to have to do a little homework here to figure out how, um, you know, when in a multi-stage machine you need to pull those eggs out. <clears throat> the next thing is, is turning is not necessary. I mentioned um, previous slide that you can place eggs on a farm rack and put them in, in into an incubator. And yes, you can do that. I've done that. You do not need to turn eggs during, egg, during the Spidey's treatment. If you can, by all means do so, but it is not necessary. <clears throat> Humidity, not really much of a concern either. Um, if you're putting eggs in a multi-stage machine, I would just, whatever your multi-stage set point is for humidity, just leave it there. If you're running a single stage machine, I would have, I just would not even run your humidity um, because humidity creates some localized cooling and it'll take a little bit longer for the shell temperature to achieve the at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit that we're needing. So again, humidity is not really of concern. Again, this is short periods of incubation during egg storage. We're not incubating, we're just doing a short little blast of incubation to keep them el the, eggs, the embryo uh, cells from, from dying. So at that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Bramwell and we will entertain any questions that you may have 
And again, I'll leave this slide up for a few for a little bit, just so that um, you guys can get my information if if you so choose. So with that, Dr. Bramwell. Thank you, Henry. Um, excellent presentation. A lot of really really good information in there that I'm sure is going to help a lot of people. Um, both now and as a reference. And again, you'll be able to reference these um, later. You'll get a link to this whole entire presentation. But very good job. I know Henry's got a lot of experience, um, personal experience with Spideys and in his previous positions before he joined James Way. So um, it fit this very well. Um, we've got a few questions here, um, Henry, if you would um, entertain. I actually got quite a few questions here. Um, see how many of them we can get to. Um, what, when you're talking about the cold rooms or the storage rooms in there, is there a particular um, velocity of air you need or is it really just making sure it's a uniform air movement, a uniform like temperature, what would, what's your experience? Yes, you want, um, it's a good, very good question. Um, I don't have a particular airflow velocity uh, like Dr. Bramwell mentioned. We want a uniform air temperature and uniform air movement. Um, in my slide, <clears throat> I mentioned, you know, we don't want high velocity. We don't want to, you know, create a chilling effect on those on those embryos because they are embryos at that point. They're very, very uh, delicate embryos at that point. So any chilling, especially if you're, if your humidification system is wetting eggs, and then you've got um, a lot of air movement over the eggs, um, it could create some issues. So again, just you want uniform temperature uh, throughout the egg room. That's critical because if you got areas that are warmer than others, um, you could have some issues. So you want good uniform air movement, good uniform temperature. That's great. Um, yeah, can you put your face back on there and get rid of the chair? <laughs> People yep. can, there we go, perfect. Um, yeah, there's an interesting relationship between um, air movement and trying to get a uniform environment. And we have to have air movement to, to keep a uniform environment. But like Henry said, if it moves too fast, it can be detrimental. If it moves too slow, it can be detrimental. It just needs to be uniform throughout and to, to uh, get the temperatures we want everywhere in our storage facilities. Another question, um, would you recommend fogging um, in your egg holding area daily with any sort of a disinfectant, um, like, like maybe as they come in or anytime during storage. What's your thoughts on that? I have. Uh, we've used um, different foggers. We've used um, you know some portable devices, and we would fog daily. Uh, we also had uh, central fogging systems in some hatcheries that I, I've been in, and again. I, yes, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, of, of fogging um, a disinfectant in, in an egg room. However, there's a couple things you need to be careful of. One <clears throat> is, you know, the product that you're using, is it, is it meant uh, for hatchery conditions? Is it meant for eggs? Um, I know if you're using, a, you know, a quaternary ammonia, you can, um, you can glaze eggs. And, and that's a terminology that I use and that maybe some other folks do, where you're actually building up the, um, the chemical on the egg and it actually seals the pores of that egg. So that's not a good thing, uh, especially as the embryo is starting to develop. So you need to be careful of that. And again, uh, you need to be careful that we're not getting eggs wet. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so making sure your procedures are correct. If you're going to go to any fogging type of system, you've got to be right. correct. Henry, we've had this discussion uh, several times before. Um, okay, um, this is kind of a, it, it's um, kind of put it in context. The question you showed the V chart on, on our egg storage, you said not to keep that, or the, the exact temperatures weren't necessarily as important as maintaining that direction. And right. there, you know, lower, lower, lowest point in the hatchery. Now, adding spideys to this mix, um, what's any difference in there, or do we still keep that same V, but then hit the egg storage room and implement things there? Or no, nothing changes with 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 that um, with that at all. 
We want to continue, um, like Dr. Bramwell mentioned, is follow the V down. Every step in the process is getting cooler and cooler. Our hatchery egg storage should be the coolest point. Nothing changes with that V. The spideys is, is a, a separate process by which we are doing short periods of incubation to revitalize, to increase the, the cells. And um, I don't know if, if repairing the damage is, is, is the, the right terminology, but we're trying to um, increase the amount of viable embryonic cells. So you still want to follow that process, even if you're doing spikes. Yep, correct. So that V process is really, if you're, if you're not doing spideys, that two temperature change down to the lowest point and then back up really holds true. When spideys is implemented in that egg room is when you start having these, these periodic increases, but you still maintain that V. Right. Um, okay, here's a good question right up right for you, Henry, with your experience. And, and I haven't personally heard you talk about this, so um, kind of interested in this. With duck eggs, um, do they follow the same pattern if you were to use spideys? Um, which day would you start the treatment? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I've not, I've not performed spideys on duck eggs, but when, when, I've, when I did my research and you looked at turkey eggs, <clears throat> again, it, the, the, my, my recommendation will hold true for turkeys and will hold true for ducks. I would try to do the first treatment five to six days of storage and then every five to six days thereafter. Or if you can't do the first treatment at five to six, whenever you can, the soonest you can, and then every five to six days thereafter. This is universal. So yes, I, my recommendation will hold true through all the different species. Because regardless whether you're hatching chickens, turkeys, ducks, whatever, um, <clears throat> you're still gonna have the same physiological effects upon that embryo through egg storage. So um, my recommendations would hold true for, uh, for ducks as well. Yeah, correct. I, I've worked with some people that have used, used the versions of this with pheasant and they've had um, some success as well on pheasant eggs. And, you know, an embryo is an embryo, avian embryo, whether it takes 18 days to develop or 52 yeah. to 56 days like an emu, you know, the same processes have to occur just at different rates. So um, yeah, so that uh, good, good answer, Henry. Um, okay, so here's, here's another question in regard to the spideys and when to use that. If you've got, say, batch of eggs coming in your hatchery and there's a four day egg different, age difference, you know, so they come in, truck comes in and they're already one to four days old. Would you be more concerned with the youngest of those groups or the oldest of the groups as far as when you would start spideys? <clears throat> Typically what I do is take the average then um, and say, okay, this is, this is my average. Because if we, if we do spideys a little bit sooner, that's okay. Uh, or if we do them a little bit after, that's going to be okay. I would just take your average egg age of that group of eggs and, and base it off of that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you're using single stage equipment, um, you mentioned that we can use our single stage to use the spideys. Um, would you do that, uh, lump them by a different age flock? or breed or anything, or basically the set, the, the, the set pattern coming up? Um, whatever your set is going to be, um, I would fill your, your, uh, your incubator, your single stage incubator up with eggs that are gonna be, you know, if you're gonna hold them for say 15 days, um, you know, and you know that, Anything that's going to be held that long or and, and go into a set, say, you know, in a, in a couple weeks here on Monday, I would, I would run them through the two Spideys treatment as a group. If that's how you're setting them, that's how I'd run them through. Treat them as, the, as they're, yep. how they're going to be set. <clears throat> here's, another, here's another good question. Um, 
if you have a maximum egg storage of say 18 days and, and you are currently using the Spideys, so would you adjust your um, egg room temperature itself that the Spideys is not being treated in? So for instance, if you've got um, say between 17, 18, which is 63, 65 Fahrenheit in your egg room, if you're doing Spideys, would you keep that egg room the same temperature or would you now need to lower it after the eggs come out of Spidey's, what do you? How would you handle that? Whatever your egg room temperature is, um, again, as long as it it meets, you know, that you know that chart that I presented earlier on in the presentation. If if you're somewhere in that ballpark for temperature, you don't need to adjust your your temperature of that egg room the eggs will after spideys will then go into the egg, egg room and get cooled down so you don't need to adjust it but you do want to make sure that you, if you're holding eggs to you know 15 17 days or whatever that you do have your cooler um your cooler temperature or your egg room temperature um to the appropriate temperature so egg room temperature is kind of independent of that correct on that line <clears throat> Okay, so another question, um, based upon when you decide to set eggs and when they come out of Spidey's, how long in between that point? I mean, if you're bringing them out of a Spidey's, is there a certain days that you should make sure you're away, set them, kind of let them settle down in that storage temperature, or how do you handle that? Yeah, I mean, if you take a look at what I recommended, um, and let me, let me see if I can get back to that. <clears throat> Come on. <clears throat> Here. <clears throat> um, so again, if, if we're keeping them for 10 days, what we want to do is we do our first treatment around five to six days. So you want at least, you know, three, three, four days or so of downtime you can get by with two days, two, three days before you actually start incubating. You don't want to do a spide treatment and then tomorrow morning put them in an incubator if you can all if you can avoid it. We again need need that uh, embryo to, to settle down a little bit. So you know three, four days if, if you can do that would be would be ideal. Yeah, I think that I think that was that question is that can you just move them right back into the incubator after that? <clears throat> Another question, to just as a clarification, um, and, and I think you mentioned this, but maybe to clarify it, are you going to use one of our single stage machines for our Spidey's program? Um, what, I mean, would you have the temperature up to the baseline of the Spidey's temperature or where the eggs are currently set? No, um, you're going you're gonna to want the temperature, like I mentioned in the presentation, uh, set point of around 99 degrees. <clears throat> Uh, once the eggs get, or once the machine gets up to that temperature, that doesn't mean your eggs are at that temperature. Your, your, your egg shells are not at that temperature yet. So that's why I said you need to keep, you need to maintain that 99 degrees for two to four hours, depending on your situation. And again, that's where, um, you know, your, your, your um, little thermometers, your data loggers, your hobos, whatever, Will can you can determine how long it takes for that um, eggshell to get up to that at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So you don't want to set your incubator to 90 degrees. It needs to be higher than that uh, because the, the again that eggshell temperature of 90 degrees as a minimum is what we're looking for. Okay, um, kind of reading through some of these other questions here. Um, um, for kind of a clarification, so if you're using a single stage machine for Spidey's, the, the machine, this is kind of answering the question on here, um, needs to be empty and used as only for that purpose. It can't be used in a partial set. Um, what about in a multi-stage hatchery? They have different buggies. Can those buggies be same ones used and pushed in? Like you mentioned, you can use a multi-stage machine. Um, how would you deal with that? Yes, you can. you can do that. Again, you're going to have to be careful um, 
and with disrupting airflow. But yes, you would you would take your 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 multi-stage buggies and put them in the multi-stage machine. Um, once they get up to the shell temperature that we that we're wanting, that 90 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you would take them back out. But again, there's some give and take with the multi-stage because again. Um, you're then going to use that multi-stage probably to put a set back into it, you know, and you just need to make sure that you're not overloading the heating capacity of that machine and, and damage the rest of the embryos in the other five racks that are in that machine. So a multi-stage is, a, you need to be a little more careful on, on how you perform it. That's why on the presentation I said, you know, single stage is best, but you can do it in a multi-stage. Um, I do know of one um, one hatchery that um, has a multi-stage that they're not utilizing for for hatching purposes, and they're um, they're running their spied they're they're spiding through that that empty um, multi-stage machine, and. Uh, and I haven't got the data back from them yet. So I'm looking forward to getting some of that data back. Um, but we talked about that a few weeks ago and, and I know they're working on that. So uh, that can be done in, in that way. Okay, back, back to the question a little bit off the spideys and just with egg storage um, itself. If you've got, if you're storing eggs in your uh, facility at uh, between 12 and 15 Celsius, which runs you about uh, 54, 59 Fahrenheit. Um, how would you con control the sweating as the eggs move from the cold room to the center? Well, um, the, the sweating is, is primarily occurring because they're going into the, um, the egg. If it's, if it's a single stage, you're gonna move your eggs as quickly as you can into your setter, but you don't want to have your setter already warmed up and up to the temperature it needs to be. That that single stage setter should be at room temperature. You'd put them in there, um, you set your eggs, get the fans running, and that'll dry up any sweating that's occurring. Uh, if you have sweating because you're, you're pre-warming eggs in the setter hallway, uh, that, that's another, that's another whole uh, different issue. And what you're going to have to do is adjust your humidity set point then such that you're um, not creating as humid an environment, um, a hot, warm environment around those cold eggs. I have a couple more questions here and we'll wrap up. A question kind of summarizing several different questions that have come in. Um, and hopefully this will answer them all. Um, you know, for specific machines, single stage, size of single stage, multi-stage, whatever, is there really anything different you would do in your Spidey's program as far as how you're treating the embryos and storing them to get them ready to put the, in the incubator in relation to whether it's a P60 or a 120 or a multi-stage or whatever? Is there any difference in that Spidey's program or is it pretty much the same thing regardless of what machine they're going in? It's, it's the same thing regardless of what machine you're going into. Um, good egg handling practices from point of lay to set is, is paramount. And then whether or not you have, you know, James Way machines or any other brand of machine, um, it, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, some other brands, your, your set point might be a little bit different, but again, you'll need to determine that based off of shell temperatures, but whether you're running are you know p p60s p80s p120s or whatever it it doesn't matter okay um all right we've got it we've got a few more questions on here we'll have to answer some of these um after the fact in in a text um maybe directly to the attendees that ask them um but uh they're, they're kind of still coming in so there's a, basically a really good topic here a lot of interest in it so if we didn't get your question answered exactly or didn't get to it please send that in an email and we'll um, uh, take it from there and have henry answer those um, again thank you for participating in this um, wednesday webinar again next week we'll be talking about ventilation with philip perry i think that'll be another good uh, 
webinar. Um, for those of you in different parts of the world, this webinar will also be um, presented again in the Asia area. It'll be at 11 o'clock Eastern in the U.S. time tonight, so that's tomorrow um, about noon, depending on where you're at um, in, in Asia. So again, thank you everybody for coming, and we hope to see you signed up for one of our next webinars. Thanks again. Thank you, Henry. Great thank job. You. Thank you.